Chapter 4 The Birdman Daniel was waiting outside my front gate early the next morning. He too had scarcely slept for worrying about the Birdman and Prince. I just hope he reached Samson and stayed the night there, that's all, he said. He wouldn't have time to get there and back. I know he wouldn't. Perhaps it's all right though. After all, he must know that stretch of water better than anyone. Come on, Gracie, let's hurry. And we ran all the way up over Samson Hill and only stopped for breath when we could see Rushy Bay below us. By now, the force of the storm was spent and the wind had died, but the sea was still seething and angry. The waves rolled into the bay from Samson, gathering and rearing as they neared the shore before they curled over the hurl themselves into, into the hissing sand. The beach was empty, there was no prince waiting for us, and we could find no message in the sand. We could see the storm had thrown up a line of debris high under the dunes and must certainly have washed away any message the birdmen might have left behind for us. Nonetheless, we, ha we had to be sure. So we searched a thin strip of dye clear sand under the dunes, just in case. That was how we came across the oar, half hidden under a tangle of seaweed. Daniel helped me to pull it clear and we carried it up onto the clean sand. Could be anyone's, couldn't it? I said, but Daniel said nothing. We scorched the beach together, peeking over the flotsam, hoping against hope. We would not come across what we were now both expecting to find. The shattered and torn timbers of the birdman's boat. We found wood enough and plenty, but it was white, wave-washed and smooth. There was no trace there was no trace either of his boat nor of the other oar. I was relieved and heartened enough by this time to imagine that all must be well, that we had indeed found an oar from someone else's boat. But Daniel insisted that we should go over the Great Par, the beach on the other side of the Hethy Hill, where we knew the birdman always kept his boat. If they are back safely, like you say they are, said Daniel, then the boat will be there, won't it? And we won't have to worry anymore, will we? We left the oar lying on top of the dunes and made our way through the reeds towards Great Par. We walked on together in silence, and all the while I dreaded we might find nothing there, that my worst fears would be realized. As we came to the top of the beach of each dune, more and more of the beach came into view, and still there was no boat to be seen. We were passing just below the birdman's cottage when Daniel stopped suddenly and caught my arm. There's no smoke, Gracie, he said, his voice hushed to a whisper. Look, can't you see? There's no smoke coming out of the chimneys. There's always been smoke before. I know there has. And there's no gulls either. There's no gulls on the roof. I looked up at the cottage, which was almost camouflaged against the background of heather on Hethy Hill and I could see Daniel was right, that the place was indeed deserted. The front door banged in the wind and no one came to shut. A corner of that had been ripped away by the storm and lay strewn around the potato field below the house. There was no sign of life on the hill except for the birdman's two goats that clambered amongst the rocks at the top of Dropy Nose Point. Then. A solitary gull flew over and hung on the wind above the cottage. It circled once above us and then flew on out over the sea towards Samson. I knew at that moment what was going through Daniel's mind, and I knew I had to forestall him. There's no one in there, Daniel, I said quickly. You can tell there's no one there. Let's go on and see if the boat's in great par. No need to get, go any closer, is there? Well. I'm not going up there, that's for sure. And suddenly, all those terrible fears of the birdman's world upside, up inside him once again. You can stay here if you like, Daniel said, ignoring my protest. But I'm going to find out if he's in there. What's the matter with you, Gracie? What's he ever done to hurt you? I mean, we know he's not mad now, don't we? Come on, Gracie, it'll be alright. I found myself following him reluctantly up the hill, through head-high breaking and heather into the biggest and best-kept vegetable garden I had ever seen, 
and passed a pair of white beehives that stood like sentries on either side of the track. Several brown hens ran squawking towards us out of the heather and then followed us up to the path at a discreet distance. We slowed, almost tiptoeing as we reached the front door that blew shut in our fa faces. Just as we reached it, Daniel knocked once. No one came. He knocked again. See, I said, pulling him back. He's not there. I told you, didn't I? I told you he wouldn't be. But Daniel paid me no attention. He lifted the latch on the door, took my hand firmly in his hand, and we stepped together into the darkness of the cottage. It was one long room with an unmade bed at one end by the fireplace and an ornate black stove at the other. And above the stove on the mantelpiece stood Woodcock, the bright blue boat we had made for him. At the back of the fireplace was a pile of dead grey ash that the wind from the open door was whipping up the room. Daniel shut the door behind him, us to keep the hens out. Almost the entire room was taken up by a long trestle table that was covered from end to end in carvings, bird carvings, finished and unfinished. And around each one of them was a group of pencil sketches pinned to the table. Some of these had been torn away by the wind and a few of the carvings had been blown over onto the floor. The floor itself was a mat of wood shavings and sawdust and the stone walls around were lined from the ceiling to the floor with shelves that bellied under the weight of hundreds of carvings. We were being watched by a silent audience of gulls and kittiwaks, petrels and gannets, merlins and puffins and plovers. Some were diving, some were preening themselves, but most stood glaring angrily at us from the shelves as if we had interrupted a secret meaning of bird conspirators. To one side of the stove were the only shelves in the room, not filled with birds. Instead, one each of the four shelves, there was a loaf of bread. I noticed that not much of was left of the loaf on the bottom shelf. I was glad to have Daniel's hand to hold. Nothing could have persuaded me to let go. He led me over to the stove and felt it. Cold, said Daniel. They haven't been back all night. We won't find his boat in Great Bar, Gracie. We won't find it anywhere. They could still be on Samson, I whispered. Couldn't they? I mean, that's what I'd do. I'd wait there till the sea was calm and it was safe to come back. That's what you do, isn't it? Daniel shook his head. The ore, Gracie. Where did the ore come from if they're still on Samson? But it didn't need to be theirs, need it? I say. Could be someone else's, couldn't it? Daniel did not answer me. A sudden gust of wind shook the cottage, rattled the windows and whistled down the chimneys, disturbing the ash in the fire grate. I moved closer to Daniel, who had picked up the end of the loaf on the bottom shelf to smell it. Wonder why he keeps four loaves, he said. Then, as if they were, made, were all answering together, the birds lining the shelves began to shriek and scream at us. There was more than I could take. Dragging Daniel behind me, I ran for the door which opened in front of us just as we reached it. Prince was suddenly around our legs, jumping at us and shaking himself all over us, and blotting out the light from the doorway was the black hooded silhouette of the birdman with a kittiwick perched on his shoulder. Above him, I could see the sky was white with screeching gulls. Daniel and I backed away towards the stove, knocking over a chair as we went. Prince followed us, sniffing at the bread in Daniel's hand. Hungry, were you? came the voice from inside the so wester. Plenty of bread, always make plenty of bread. Bake one a day, always have plenty in reserve in case I get ill. I keep the fresh to last on the top shelf. You can have some of that if you like. The kittiwake lifted off his shoulder and landed clumsily amongst the carvings on the table, knocking one of them over. He hopped on one leg, the other seemed curled up and stunted, and he would not use it. The birdman shut the door behind him, pulled off his sewister, and shook it dry. Bit of a bluster out there, I can tell you, he said. The words he spoke were unformed and unfinished. They seemed yawned out rather than spoken, and, they, and then thrown out from the top of his mouth. 
He heaved his black cape off his shoulder, wincing as he did so, folded it and laid it carefully on the floor. All his movements were painfully slow and stiff. He whistled sharply and Pritz left us at once and sat down on the cape, looking from the birdman to us and back again, as if waiting for someone to say something. But no one said a word. We must have spent a full minute looking at each other. The old man I saw in front of me was not at all as I expected him to be. All my life I thought he would the, have the predatory look of an ancient crow under the shadow of his sewister. I could hardly have been more wrong. Only the tried stoop of his body and the loose mottled skin of his forearm betrayed his age. His face was the color of a well-worn polished brown boot. The skin was creased but still young and supple. Not that you could see much of his face, for it was almost entirely hidden by head and beard of wild white hair. But it was his eyes that marked him out from any other man I had ever seen, for they drew into them somehow so that you, you could not look away even if you wanted to. So, at last we meet, he said, breaking a long silence. I'm glad you came. I was afraid you would never come, you know. Of course I could have gone down to the beach, I suppose, but then you'd have run away as soon as you saw me coming, wouldn't you? Not allowed to get too close to me, are you? Keep your distance. Is that what they told you? I don't blame them. Everyone runs away from me. I'm quite used to it by now, but I didn't want to risk that. Not with you. That's why I sent Prince here down to see you, and I hope he would bring you home with him one day. But you never came. I thought of inviting you, of leaving a message in the sand, asking you to come and visit, but then I thought that might frighten you away and you'd never come back. Still neither Daniel or I spoke. The kitty wake on the table glared evilly at us, first with one eye, then the other. The birdman shook his head. Bit of a mess in here, isn't it? He said. Of course, if I had known you were coming today and I have tidied the place up a bit. Mother always said there was no one as untidy as I was. But I haven't had anyone up here in this house since she died. And that's nearly 30 years ago now. Nothing much to tidy up for it if you never have visitors, is there? I mean, they don't mind, do they? And he laughed, looking around the room at the birds on the shelves. The wind blew the door open again by the look of it. Ash everywhere. Still, not too much harm done, though. One day, I'll have to get around to mending the latch on that door. Been meaning to, but there was always seemed to be something else to be done. Never enough hours in a day. He stood looking at us and his smile opened his mouth. He did not have many teeth. What a gale that was last night, wasn't it? I can tell you I was lucky. Halfway across to Samson, I was when it hit us. Came in faster than I thought it would. Only just made it. The dog came with me, of course. Always does, don't you, boy? He always likes to go over to Samson. Likes the rabbits, he does. And there's rabbits everywhere over there. Great big black ones. Oh, he loves his rabbits. Of course, I don't often go out in the boat nowadays. Only cross to Samson when I have to. I can't pull against the wind like I used to. Getting old, you know? I spent the night over there like I usually do. Only one cottage left with the roof on it now. Not like it used to be, I can tell you. Made a fire, kept herself warm, didn't we, Prince? And the mention of his name, the dog looked up from cleaning a paw. He sweat, tail slapping in against the wall behind us. Then this morning, first light, with, with the wind around behind us and the worst of the storm blown out, I thought we tried to roll back. Thinking about it now, I suppose I should have waited an hour or two, but I had the goats to milk and the hens to feed, I had to get back from them. Poor old things, and if I leave friend alone for too long, he goes off all over the island looking for me. All the way up to Shipman's Head he goes, dangerous up there, even for a donkey. So I had to get back. I tell you though, I never had to pull so hard in all my life, did I, Prince? Then this old wish had to go and give up on me. He held up his left hand and flexed his gnar gnarled fingers slowly. It just seized up. Nothing I could do about it. Couldn't hold on to the oar anymore. Couldn't grip it. Worse of getting old. Your body won't do what you tell it anymore. 
It was just off the point out there. We nearly ended up on the rocks after that. Didn't we, Prince? I had to paddle my heart out with the one oar. Don't know how we may we managed it, but we did. And the waves brought us nicely into popple stones. I looked up and there was old friend himself waiting for me, as if he knew I was going to beach there all the time. So I had to ride home and here I am. And I'll tell you something else, for nothing. I wasn't the only th thing washed up on popple stones. I've never seen anything like it. The whole beach is covered with timber. Great thick pine planks there are. Finest looking timber I've ever seen. And no sign of a wreck that I could see, just the timber. Gracie found the oar, Daniel said, but the mer birdman did not hear him. He's, he raised his voice a little. She found the oar, Mr. Woodcock, the one you lost. It's still down there in, in the dunes. We left it there. We thought we're done for, didn't we, Gracie? A sudden troubled look had come over the birdman. The smile that had lit his face until now trembled and vanished, and he turned away from us while Daniel was still speaking. He lowered himself carefully onto his knees by the fire and began to break up the pile of lightnings. Daniel and I exchanged, exchanged glances. That's why we came up here, Mr. Woodcock, Daniel went on, to see if you and Prince were all right, because we knew you went off to Samson yesterday. We saw you rowing out there. Then when the storm came last night, we thought the birdman still had his back to us and seemed intent on lighting his fire. The paper flared and he bent down to blow on it until the flames were shooting up through the lightnings into the chimney. He sat back on his haunches and watched it. I nudged Daniel, willing him to go on talking, but he shook his head. I mouthed to him silently, The war! Tell him about the war! Daniel nodded and tried again. By this time, the burn man was sitting on the corner of his bed holding his hands out and rubbing them together in front of the flames. Mr. Woodcock, Daniel began, even louder now to be sure he was heard. You know, we told you that what Welly Belly said. You remember? He thought there was going to be a war soon. Well, they started it, Mr. Woodcock, just like he said they would. They started yesterday. It's all right, though. Everyone seems to think we'll win it fairly quickly, but we've got to be on the lookout now for ships and submarines and things just in case we get invaded. That's what my father told me. And we're not allowed to show any lights at night. We have to draw the curtains. The birdman looked up, his face filled with resignation. He put his hands on his knees and pushed himself up until he stood looking down at us again. You can talk all you want, Daniel, but I won't hear a word of it. Not a word. These old ears of mine don't work like they should. Haven't done since I was a boy. Mother always said it was the fever that I, that did it. The fever I caught the day we left Samson. All I remember was the ringing in my ears and the roar of an endless wind blowing through my head. I could hear after the fever went, but the world was always muffled to me after that. As the years passed, I heard less and less. And now, these last couple of years, I can't even hear my goals. All I can hear is an empty silence. I'm as deaf as my wooden birds over there, Daniel. I can read though, mother saw to that, but you know that already, don't you? So if you've got something to tell me, you have to write it down or draw it. Got plenty of paper, keep it for drawing the birds. And he reached into the drawer of the little table by his bed and took out a pencil and a sheet of paper and put them down on the table side. You spell better, said Daniel, handing me the pencil. You tell him. So I wrote in my best handwriting. They began the war yesterday, and Daniel turned the piece of paper around so that the burn man could read it. When he looked up again, there was anger in his eyes. It's wrong, he said. It's all wrong. All king killing is wrong. I tell you, I should know better than anyone. I should know. I should know. And then, as if he had suddenly had enough of us, Time you were going. I've got my goats to milk and my hens to feed, and you'd better get back home and quickly. Must have been in the sea sometime already, that timber. Maybe most of the night. Doesn't do it any good to stay in the sea any longer than it's got to know, got to you know. So you get back home now and tell them all to get out to 
popple stones as quick as they can. There are cartloads of it there, I tell you. Enough to build ten houses. You'll have to hurry, else it'll be too late. Soon as the presentative hear about it, and they always do, they'll be crawling o over the island off with you now. We were almost out of the door before they called us back. Children, he said, more gently now. That cormorant I gave you must be getting lonely all by himself. I think perhaps you ought to have another one to keep him company. Token of your first visit. And he picked up one of his carvings off the table, brought it up close to his eyes to examine it. It was a crying gull with its wings half opened and a flat fish on the rock under his feet. I don't think I can do much more with this one. Like to take it with you? Daniel took it from him with great care and he looked at the birdman, pointed at his own lips and mouth slowly and silently, separating each word. It is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, I said, following Daniel's example. And the birdman understood and laughed aloud. You'll come back and see me tomorrow if you can, he said. Now get along with you and get that timber hidden away before the presentative find it.